Welcome back to another DC Breakdown. We're breaking down Campaign 3, Episode 7 of Critical Role. So there's your little spoiler warning because we're breaking down everything in this episode. And we're starting off with the very end of the episode where Travis comes back with his new character. What do you think about it? I'll let you know what I think about it, the pros, the cons. There's a lot of stuff to break down because I had a lot of thoughts. I'll be breaking down the rest of the episode later, but I do want to start off talking about this. You can see the timestamps down below if you want to jump around into the different sections. But to start things off with, if you don't know and you don't necessarily watch the episode, because I always try and make these user friendly to where you could watch them without watching the episodes, is Travis Willingham is a very popular player of Critical Role. He started off the campaign with everybody else playing Bertrand Bell. He had had played that character before in a one shot back in uh, the grog one shot that they did that was his player because he couldn't play grog so he played this fighter type character and this is an older version of the character i thought that was a really cool intro and then the character died oh my gosh and he lost the character and travis hasn't been at the table for like four episodes now it was crazy and then I've been waiting for when he's going to come back. How is he going to come back? How is he going to tie into the story? It, it didn't come back the next session or the next one or the next one. Oh my gosh, this is crazy. Who's this character going to be? And again, I'm going to get into the pros and cons of it, but his character finally comes back this episode. So how can you as a dungeon master learn from this? And how would you handle it at your table? Have you had this happen before? Have you struggled with this before? That's what we're going to break down and we're going to break it down right now. Pros and cons. I think the best way to handle this, to split this whole thing up into the pros of how cool this thing is and some cool things to take away from it and things that I like about this character and how it was handled. And then the cons of, oh, interesting. And again, these are the cons freshly after this whole thing went down. I literally just watched this thing and I'm giving you my reactions to it right now. So these are the initial moments from watching it, like the feelings that I get from watching it and my thoughts of, we're going to start off with the cons. But a quick disclaimer before I do is I love Critical Role. I've loved watching these episodes. I loved this episode. I liked Robbie Damon as the new player of here and to bring back in Travis and now there's all eight of them. That's a lot of players, man. I don't know how they do it, but I do love it. And I love as a dungeon master i've learned so much from them but this is now where we can kind of break down things we are going to play the game differently than each other things i say in all my different videos of homebrews there's going to be ones that you don't like and that's totally fine because we don't play the exact same game that's a beautiful part of dungeons and dragons and as dungeon masters how we run our game is also completely different so when i say there's things that i don't agree with that's just simply my opinion and I'm sharing my opinion and I want you to share yours down in the comments, but always stay positive because we can always learn from each other and watching these episodes is a chance for us to think out and live out some things that haven't happened at our table yet, or maybe they have and we handled it differently and we can all learn from it. So my first con here is I feel like this character came out of nowhere. And I think this problem is I might've amped it up like I did with Star Wars or, or <laughs> Game of Thrones, or whatever, is I amped this thing up to be this certain thing. And I had these expectations in my mind, as maybe some of you did as well, as who this new character is. And I think a lot of any sort of weird feelings I had are on that and are self-imposed by myself because I'm like, oh, they started off the campaign with Bertrand Bell. Brilliant move. I absolutely love that. He was basically a DNPC as a character that would, could just glue them together. And I thought that was brilliant and beautiful. And then his character died, which elevated the stakes. So many cool things came from Bertram Bell. And then Travis's new character is going to come in. And as soon as it didn't come in the first episode, second, third, it's been a while. I was like, whoa, okay. There's some big mega plot thing going on. And Matt's waiting for the perfect time. And as the dungeon master, he has this big story and maybe his character his character is tied so deeply into the story that they couldn't start off with that character and they had to wait until a certain story moment to find maybe he's a part of this like court of owls thieves people maybe he's one of the groups that they're going and finding maybe he's going to be associated with them and it wouldn't make sense to start him off with the campaign oh my god that's brilliant i had all these thoughts and then when his character is revealed to be Chutney, or AKA reflavoring of Chutney, which is another one shot character that he's played in a Christmas, like a jokey, fun, haha -ha Christmas one shot that he's now bringing into this campaign. I was thrown for a curveball. That was a quietly, quite unexpected uh, twist there that I wasn't ready for. And I had built up all these cool, serious toned, epic storytelling mastermind type stuff. 
and then that didn't happen. So now I question why did he not just start off on this character and maybe tie this character's backstory into the other ones? But then I guess I answer that with, oh, Bertrand Bell glued this group together. And also, we don't know a lot about this character. He came in at the very end of the episode. We have no idea what's going on. So there will be things that happen since then. But this is the initial thoughts. <laughs> Overall, I just feel like I'm not as connected to this character that I hyped it up to be. And it feels like a joke character. Because in all reality, it is a reflavoring of a joke character to still be a woodworker. He still has his little elf shoes on. There's a lot of the little things from the Santa Christmas one-shot that is still being kept in this character. And it's another one-shot character that that is from something else. So he played a one-shot character and then it died and now he's playing another one-shot character. And I'm wondering, is this a permanent character or is this one also gonna be killed off or leave? And is Travis just gonna be this open door of different characters? That's really interesting. And if that's the thing where they go into the future, I'm going to call it right now. Maybe that's the direction here. And maybe one of the things they hinted at about telling stories differently is Travis as the CEO of this company is really busy with stuff. And maybe he's just coming in for characters and then leaving and then having fun in these little random moments to enhance the story. Cause man, Travis is an amazing player. I laughed even the little sliver that he came to the table. It was hilarious. And just how he talks to the people. Ah! Yeah, it's it. I love seeing him play old people as well. So there's little positives in there too. So maybe that logistically for their real life situation, it makes sense for Travis to come in and leave, come in and leave. But now I'm not as, I, I, I worry to connect to the character because it's just a little baby character that's going to come and leave. Now, what I mean when I say this character feels like a, a joke is I had a player that wanted to play basically Goku from Dragon Ball Z in our campaign. The campaign was already predetermined by the players to be a very low magic campaign, Kingdoms at War. And then this player wanted to play a Super Saiyan Dragon Ball Z style. And I have a homebrew D&D class of a Super Saiyan. And I was like, oh my gosh. So these are those moments as a dungeon master that you want to give the player what they want. They want to play this certain class or this certain character, this certain thing, and you want to make it happen for them. But uh, is it going to invalidate your entire world? Now there's a Super Saiyan running around. Everybody at the table is going to be like, oh no, like some one of my other players voiced concern to me one-on-one -on -one privately about, I don't really know if like that feels kind of bad, like like just a Super Saiyan in the middle of the house is going to be explained. And it, it, if there's a certain seriousness that you want your players to take. And if it's a funny, jokey campaign, everybody wants to do whatever, that's a different vibe for your table. But what is that vibe that you want to go for? And does this rub you the wrong way? Because initially I was like, I, I, okay, I can't. We have said low magic and you can't just be this flying golden haired we gotta reflavor it some so long story short on that i reflavored it to be a mech suit and the form transforming was some sort of tech that the other artificer in the group was going to be able to do and there's also a warforged in the group so they were going to collectively together be able to tinker on this individual as they built this like almost like a suit of armor iron man style to be able to activate these powers that would be similar to a super saiyan so i say all of that to say that travis wanted to play chutney which i'm sure whenever he told matt that matt was like oh wow okay how how are we gonna do this and that is props to matt so there's some you know obviously some pros sprinkled in here that i'll get to in a second but that's props to matt for letting him play the character that he wanted to play and not being like no no no, you need to come up with a serious character no but i'm gonna get into all the pros here in just a second because my last con here is this felt out of nowhere and kind of forced onto the group where they finish this fight in an alley versus a mimic wall. And then after the fight's over, the time's wrapping up here. It's about to be the end of the episode. And then they see a, a figure over there hunched over and then they introduce themselves and it's Travis's character and he comes over. And I was like, oh, wh wow. Okay, interesting. In fact, here's that moment. Do you need something? Travis, you want to come to the table? What's happening? He just died! And he was trolling us on text all night! Oh my god, he finally stopped texting us. Jeez. Where'd he go? No more screen grab. Would you like to ask the question once more to the target of your message? I don't even remember what I said. Do you want Do you something? Want something? Need something, want something. You, need you want something? Who? Who is that? Oh no. Who's speaking, please? 
It's so oh, no. No, no. So an exciting moment for sure. And I was even cracking up just seeing him be at the table again, crossing his arms, playing an old gnome character. But uh, especially because I set it up to be this thing about, oh, the story moment. They're waiting so long to be able to weave him in at the right time. And they find some sort of, and then it connects into the all these things. And then it just ended up being a one shot character span in to be a character waiting in the alley for them to then say i need help finding somebody and then that's that's all we that's where it lives off at so th that in a nutshell is where this weird feeling comes in for me especially because i hacked it up myself so bad like i said before i keep wanting to reference star wars here about ray and who her past is and i thought she was ray kenobi because of all these things but it ended up Eh, don't want to get into it. But now to shift over to the positives, because I don't want to just be raining on this parade, because I am so excited for Travis to be back at the table playing any character, much less one of my favorite characters that he's ever played before, Chutney slash Chetney. And if anything, I referenced this probably like two uh, Critical Role Breakdown episodes ago, this makes Critical Role feel a lot more like a normal table than maybe it used to. It feels, you know, this is a very professional, very well done. They're professional voice actors. They have the best stage ever. The quality, the production values through the roof. And it starts to get elevated to the point where it feels less like a good old home Dungeons and Dragons game. This makes it feel far more like a real home game than anything else before because this these are types of things that our players do to us is oh, i want to play i want to play this thing how can we make this work <laughs> okay all right you're gonna play we're gonna spin it to be chetney and then you know, maybe there's not a santa killing backstory type thing but whatever his backstory is it'll be similar and it'll be funny and this is that thing where myself as a dungeon master i probably am too serious sometimes and i probably do put the story and the seriousness and the all of the plot and everything connecting together. I probably take that a little too seriously, just self-reflecting. And that why that maybe rubbed me the wrong way, but it's gonna be really fun to just give in to that and just allow myself to watch whatever the heck Chetney does in this group of what I felt like was a already kind of a established serious characters from Exandria Unlimited. They're very serious. Laudna Imogen, very serious. Fresh Cut Grass, maybe not as serious. I think it's gonna be a really interesting mix of things, especially now with Travis added back in here, but this feels a lot more homey and something that Matt's going to have to deal with. And this whole thing's off the rails. Okay, we got a, a one-shot character brought back in. All right, let's have fun with it. And that's the whole point is to have fun with it. And if they love it and just seeing, again, watching it back after I've had all these thoughts, seeing their reaction, like, oh, no. Oh, no. And then once they realize it's Chetney, I don't know how much they knew beforehand of who he was going to come back in and play. But that's just crazy. In a very similar way to how Sam is playing an automaton named Fresh Cut Grass and how that's crazy and silly. But I'm really interested to see where they take this and how much fun they have with it. This is also, like I said earlier, further props to Matt to not have and really the whole team, because this is a show. This is a, a team that has production value. All the stuff that I said, they aren't too good to have these type of moments happen. No, 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 we must all come up with very serious characters with very tragic backstories and come together and have a show for the people and they get engaged to these new characters. No silly business. No, no, you can't play one-shot characters. That's ridiculous. It again feels so real that Travis just wanted to play Chetney. In fact, there's a tweet from Matt Mercer I have here saying, uh, Travis had so much fun playing Chetney in ye old Christmas one-shot, he wanted to give him a true legit spin. So Critical Role's not too good to do something like this and have something silly like this happen and Matt Mercer is going to make it happen for Travis to be able to play this really awesome character in an actual campaign now which is cool. So now for a quick intermission before we get into what actually happened during episode seven, I wanna know what you guys think of all this. I might've sounded like I just contradicted myself. Oh, it's weird and I don't like it. Oh, I really love it, I look forward. But that's the weird feeling I feel. I probably put my expectations of who Travis is gonna play. Is he gonna play an artificer? Is he gonna play a rogue? How does it fit into this backstory? Why is he waiting so long? I tried to answer all these questions and the answer wasn't what I thought, which then in inherently just feels bad to us as humans but now i am completely open to whatever the heck this thing happens and i'm excited to see what happens next episode because we're going to have travis for a whole episode and that alone i'm just excited for much less how chetney merges in with this group in whatever way he's going to so let me know what you think down below and now we're going to get into our first breakdown point here of a description that matt mercer gave which brings us to the sponsor of this video describe because if you have ever struggled with description to the table as a player or especially as a dungeon master trying to set the stage for what I'm about to show that Matt Mercer does here, 
You need to be able to have some sort of vocabulary. Being able to use the words you say to help paint a picture in your players' minds of the scene that you're about to go to, whether it's a town or a spell being cast. You want to be able to get that across, and that's where Describe.com comes in. Describe.com is an online resource with professionally written text boxes, and they have hundreds of them. Everything from monsters, towns, dungeons, NPC, dialogue, back and forth, that can help inspire your games. They have a quick and easy search bar that lets you search for anything in their entire vault of things that you wouldn't even know that you need it. So if you want to level up your descriptions, check out describe.com. They have a lot of them completely for free. But if you want access to every single one of these descriptions, then they do have a membership thing you can get. And if you use code the dungeon coach, you can get 10% off. Describe.com has been an awesome partner of this channel. If you want to check out any of that stuff, the link's down in the description. So for this first clip of breaking down, Matt's about to describe the setting for this stage of this theater that's about to have a performance being done. And he's going to be describing the performance being done. And all the players are going to be sitting there listening to him talk for this whole thing. They don't really have a lot to do besides listen to him describe these things. We see this overall description thing. The coolest part here though is Matt, as he's telling the story, is also rolling dice to help him tell the story, which I thought was really cool. And I've done myself before whenever something's about to happen and then ooh, let's roll a dice for it and then here we go. As they begin to release themselves into a flurry of flips and backhand springs and tosses into the air, a brilliant display of physical prowess back and forth across the stage. You're waiting for the moment so they collide, and they do not, it seems, they do not. <laughs> <laughs> See the reaction? It goes, it goes pretty damn well. There's a few moments where you find yourself clutching the wood on the edge of your chairs, uncertain if this is safe or going to end poorly, but with extreme speed and a practiced capability, you watch as they finish their first flurry of their gymnastics routine. And as they all begin to take their places at the side, one by one, they begin to leap from the sides onto one side of the saw and catch the other and flip and rotate and catch off of bars that you didn't even notice were fixed higher onto the stage. With that, you watch as the, the energy begins to rise, and as they're doing this, the song changes. Now they're vocalizing a harmony, and as it progresses, it's you can't help but feel enraptured by this combination of physical capability and musical prowess. And nothing bad happens. It's going great without it. <laughs> Reaction. The audience is in hushed gasps and whispers and cheering and shh. I really do love this for the feeling that he gets at the table. The players aren't really had now. Imogen had something that she wanted to do about checking out the audience, and they, they can react and chime in and say stuff, but I think it adds a level of unpredictability and fun for myself as the Dungeon Master included to say what happens and how this performance is going, and then, now I don't know what's going on in Matt's mind whenever he does this, because I do this myself whenever I have certain moments where I want to let the dice be inspired by what's about to maybe happen. Because sometimes you just say what happens because that's what obviously would happen. But if there's ever a question or you want to spice it up like this, roll that dice and see how that moment could change. For myself, I like to go by five. So one through five, something really bad happens. Six through 10, okay, something unideal or they stumble or something in, in this theater type example. And then an 11 through 15 is something good and like, okay, nice, that's what was supposed to happen, happen. And then 16 or above, oh, wow. And of course, natural ones and natural 20, something crazy happens. Or you could have this instead of chunks of five, you could only have the five at the ends matter and everything in the middle, it goes as normal. Here's a great example of what I'm trying to say here. Let's say that Matt did this exact same story and did not roll any dice and was leading up to these moments and Nothing bad happens, blah, 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 and he didn't roll any dice for it. There'd be no real funny moment there. They would, he would just be describing what happens. And if something amazing happens and he didn't roll for it, it would just be something amazing that was already going to happen and it, nothing could have changed that because he just said it, right? But then if he rolls a dice before those moments, where before something bad happens, before something good happens, now it's the dice playing into it, just like the game that we're all at the table playing. So the dice are affecting the players and the dungeon master, and it feels good at the table because something bad happened, oh, because he rolled the bad, oh, something good could have happened, oh, but it didn't because the dice roll, oh, and it's all centered around the dice, and that feels good. And this is not a video I'm gonna talk about fudging rolls on, but in this moment, if you wanted to tell a story and have something really funny happen or something really bad happen, 
happen, you could just roll the dice and continue to tell the story and we get across that same effect. But that's up to you to decide as a dungeon master if you want to fudge that roll or not. Because is that roll cheating? Does that roll go against the spirit of the game when it comes to combat or players' lives or players' agency? I don't think so, but that's for another video. Let me know down below if you want to get my stance on fudging rolls because I've seen a whole bunch of videos recently talking about it. So anyway, to change the topic now to point number two here that we're going to break down is Laudna really pushes the limits of a cantrip. All you need to know is something's happening in the theater and Laudna wants to say that there's a fire and cause people to leave the theater. And she's going to use a cantrip and you'll see what happens. Can come up with something where... I got it. Oh, yeah. And I cast Thaumaturgy. Sure. And then from uh, uh, backstage you hear, fire! Fire! Everybody leave! Fire! Oh, God. <laughs> In a literal open theater. He's looking at his phone. <laughs> oh, yeah. Looking at Thaumaturgy. The dream? And then uh, okay. I Thaumaturgy again, you start to smell smoke. <laughs> She's off the rail. She's running away with it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thaumaturgy one more time. Looks like smoke. <laughs> Jesus, thaumaturgy is the greatest spell ever. It trips in the limits a little bit of thaumaturgy here with this. <laughs> it's a cantrip, but it's enough to get a few people's attention. Uh, the the I take it this is the instantaneous sound. Yeah. Okay. It's not a phrase in this day, so fire is about as much as fire. you can get out with it. So fire. 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 From backstage? <laughs> oh man, oh man, we've all been there when players are starting to try and stretch the limits of some part of the game, whether it's a cantrip or not, or what this potential of a spell can do, or what a feature can do, or what an item can do. So you can see, oh man, gets the phone out, looks up the thaumaturgy, sees where these limitations are, and imposes a limitation of technically you know, just to power check it a little bit. This is the, it's, it's not a power struggle between players and dungeon masters. You don't want it to become that whole situation. Players should understand that, you know, the DM, what they say goes, all that kind of stuff. But Matt does clarify that, okay, it's not a complete phrase because he's also layering in this rule here at this moment so that later in the future when they try and do something crazy, it has a little bit of a power check in there of Matt saying, it's not a phrase, it's an instantaneous sound so you can get out fire. You can't get out, get out, there's a fire, which semantically, does that really matter? Is there any difference there? No, but Matt is at least giving a little bit of a power check towards this whole situation. And then pretty much things unfold as they would have, as if it was a whole phrase. So you know, that's kind of what I'm talking about. That's a very subtle thing as a dungeon master, but I would do the same thing. Say like, okay, well, all right, this is a cantrip and it's really gonna kind of be, this is kind of how it would look. It's not as grand as you're thinking about like, oh, fire, oh my God, there's smoke everywhere. It's just a cantrip, okay? For myself as a dungeon master, I love these moments because the players are showing you what they want to be able to do better. Whenever they start to push the limits of what their character can currently do into things that they currently can't do, this is where I love, I have a whole system, I've done multiple videos on the channel for it, bonus level up perks. It's my favorite, it's my player's favorite homebrew that I do of whenever players level up, I give them extra little bonuses towards something that they can do better now. So for Laudna, maybe once they level up or maybe right now, or you can give them to them between level ups too, if you wanna do it like that. But let her have a stronger thaumaturgy. Maybe she can have two effects go simultaneously and you start to allow this power to go in there at a slow checked rate. This lets players both be able to customize their character's power growth in the certain way that they want to play their character. But I have entire videos on bonus level up perks. What I would have done here as a dungeon master, I, these moments happen whenever they try and use cantrips in these ways. And this happens before in other breakdowns videos I've done, but have them make a spell check for the cantrip. That's a perfectly normal thing to do. Spells aren't immune to this, especially cantrips. If somebody wants to climb a wall and they're describing all these physical type things, they're gonna make a check for it. Laudna's going crazy with these triple layer, quadruple layered thaumaturgies that she's going into. Have her make a check for it. As soon as she starts going off the deep end, describing fire and then smoke and then smell of smoke, as soon as she's describing all these things, all right, okay, well, hold on, hold on. Let's see how this thing goes. Make a spell check. How that would work is she's a warlock, so her spell modifier is charisma, so she would have her charisma bonus plus her proficiency bonus, and that would be what she adds to the roll she makes. Or I've also ruled as a dungeon master that they would not add their proficiency bonus if they're using a spell in ways that they normally technically haven't yet. And then over time, as they show through role play or through these type moments where they want to use to create smoke or create sounds or create voices and stuff, then I would let them allow their proficiency bonus if it makes sense. But the beautiful thing is now you've absolved yourself from the responsibilities here of saying no and feeling bad like you're just, oh no, it's just a cantrip, no. And by all means, if a player is pushing the limits, you should say no, it is an okay thing to do. I could do a whole video on that. 
but at least if they roll really low, they're not going to get this big effect from all these cantrip type things. Like the sound that no one really heard is not really that loud. Fair. They couldn't really tell that it was fire. And then the smoke's real wispy and then weird. And people are just more so confused than scared. Overall, now it's on the dice. If she rolls really low, it's, oh, no, it doesn't go off like you said. Oh, if she rolls really high now. Okay, wow, go ahead and go with it. But at least it's not the, pop, the player abusing a cantrip in some way that they're going to always be able to do. At least the dice are telling the story in the moment. Third breakdown clip here another moment that just feels bad i'm going to show you the feel bad moment and then i'll talk about why it feels bad and how it never i never have these moments at the table whether or not it feels bad for you that's another thing for you to decide liam's character orm the fighter is looking around trying to find somebody in a crowd in some sort of space that there's looking for somebody in a crowd and ladna wants to help him here we go i'll kind of fade back with orm and just be a second set of eyes with him as well okay so perception here 22 22 okay well, Assistance. I was. At, I'm always at advantage. <laughs> That's a secret. He's always at advantage. <laughs> I absolutely love it when players want to work together to collaborate on something they're trying to do, and they should be better at doing it together than they would be apart. And yes, I know Liam's shield, for whatever reason, grants him advantage on perception checks. And in this case, I don't know if that would really, it's a more of a combat type thing, but sure, he gets advantage on perception checks. He would be better at doing that if he had a friend helping him look around. That's just a more helpful thing. Sure. How helpful is that? Sure. I, for myself, any sort of advantage always is instead a plus two. And I've said this before, but these are the types of moments that I'm like, oh, like I, that feels bad. I don't know. Marisha handled it great. And was like, oh, well, uh, you know, and then it's just gone. But I feel like it would be, a, a, oh, okay, let me help you. And then he could maybe succeed at that. And and he ends up rolling a 19, which is really, really nice. And he would have added those modifiers and added another plus two. And the other person he's searching after also rolled really high. Maybe that extra plus two because he failed the roll, by the way. He failed the roll, he rolled a 19, added all his modifiers, he still wasn't able to get up to the high stealth check that this NPC made. But maybe he could have if he had another little plus two, and maybe that moment would have been the reason why he found, that feels great, that's awesome, that's really cool. And it rewards players for working together, but I've ranted about why advantage stacking should be a thing anyway, so moving on. Fourth point's a big one here of perception versus investigation. Where's the line you draw? Which one's which? What types of things are what? But that's not really what I'm also going to get into. I'll share my thoughts of what my stance is on that at the end here. But what's happening here is they are looking around. They're trying to investigate and look through stuff and find things. And it's some sort of mystery type exploration thing they're doing. And he keeps letting them, Matt keeps letting them choose between perception or investigation. So I'm going to show you the clip and then I will break it down. All manner of various, you know, slidable ropes and sandbags and the general theater arrangement. Okay, yeah. so I'm just going to, I'll scan the catwalks for any anything odd. I don't think I'll find anything, but I, I still will. But I'll also look for any kind of like trap doors in the, the ceiling of the theater that lead up and out. Good call. Go to make a perception check or investigation. Super simple clip there, but that's the choice of perception or investigation. And now I'm going to get into the breakdown is not what is perception and what is investigation. In general, I'll go ahead and say this. My view of perception is what you see around you and what you're looking at with your eyeballs. But as soon as you start messing and touching with things and looking and picking up things and looking around, that's now investigation. So if you are observing things without touching it and trying to just look and observe, that's perception. As soon as you start looking and tinkering and feet and like touching things, manipulating things, moving it around, see how it works, looking around, stuff like that, that's investigation. Look, feeling out for traps and looking at that, that figure how things work, that type of thing, investigation, right? So that's my line. So if the, depending on, and I like to act, to clarify, which one are you doing? Are you just generally trying to look around or are you touching things? Because a lot of times that matters. If it has to do with touching it, an investigation check's a little more risky because you got to go get up in there. But if you're just looking around, that's a lot safer thing to do. So in general, that's where my lines are drawn. But here, I think there's something more in depth, more advanced possibly for Dungeon Masters in this moment. If you want to give out more information, give your players more options to be able to choose what type of checks they're making. I do this a lot. If I'm in a moment where I want them to find things, right now they're in the middle of a mystery and we all know play in, in that little exploration type of thing, they're trying to find stuff and figure out stuff. If they keep rolling bad, 
or making poor checks, they're going to get stuck. And that doesn't feel good. That doesn't feel fun. You want to get them to get through this thing and find out what they need to find out to go into the next part and keep things moving, right? Too many dead ends gets a little clunky, right? So this is when you should give your players a bunch of options of, of I would do the same exact thing Matt does here. I wouldn't even ask for clarification between, oh, now, whoa, whoa, wait, are you touching it? Or are you, lo no, 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 I, you can make a perception investigation. Whichever one's better, because I want you to get information here, because we want to keep things moving, right? So as a dungeon master that I want, I'm in a, in a state of wanting to give information, I'm going to be more lenient on what type of checks I'm going to give them the options for. Especially another example is if you're out in the forest and out in the wilderness and you're looking around trying to find stuff. Okay, uh, go ahead and make a check for me. Whichever one would be the best, you could do nature, wisdom, uh, intelligence. I might even allow a history check to think if they've been in this type of area or read anything about you know what i'm saying so you can be as lenient as you want whenever you're trying to give out more information but if you want things to be a little bit more difficult or you're trying to be hard on them in a the moment and you really maybe don't want them to know it yet and you want to keep that a little closer to the chest not reveal it yet you want to make them earn it more be a little more strict because there's been times in the past where players have asked to make a perception check and the matt has said no it's an investigation and clarified more and so i'm going to be looking out for a moment like that to see if that's maybe something Ooh, they don't want them to know then there's a the whole combat here to break down with this mimic wall fight but we've already been yakking long enough about all the theories about Travis's new character how that whole thing's handled what you guys think of so comment down below let me know I might pull a lot of these thoughts and any sort of leftover pieces because these videos would be way too long if I said everything that I thought about each one of them so I try and just pick the highlights but if there's certain things that you want my opinion on or thoughts that you feel like I missed or like oh what about this in the combat let me know because I can save I save all these different notes of the leftover pieces and possibly for other videos I could make in the future if you guys want to see them but if this series keeps doing as well as it's been doing uh, like the video share it around everybody whatever it is you do i appreciate you being here and even staying this long to the video really does help out me trying to do this thing even bigger and better and keep this thing rolling so happy holidays stay thinking outside the box peace